I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 25th season. The beauty of Zoom is that today Tom signs in from Brooklyn, Ken from England, and Chris and I from Los Angeles. Film critic Tom Schoen is an author of several books about movies. His new book, The Nolan Variations, written with the cooperation of Christopher Nolan, is a magnificent study of a most complex filmmaker. Chris Nolan is creator of blockbusters one after another from the great Dark Knight films to Inception to Dunkirk. Blockbusters by definition cater to a huge swath of the population, but Nolan's movies are starkly personal. It's a singular talent to muse on abstractions such as dreams, identity, or time, and still speak to so many around the world. How does Nolan maintain his personal vision while creating blockbusters that capture a global audience? The Nolan Variations is a canvas of pop culture as well as Nolan's literary and artistic touchstones, from David Hockney to Dickens to Chariots of Fire. It's a remarkable tableau of a singular artist. You will have questions, and you can email us during the program at reservations at writersblockpresents.com, and we'll try to address them. Ken Branagh is a great artist and director in his own right. Ken's Henry V is one of the most thrilling Shakespeare adaptations I've ever seen in any medium on any stage. He's given us a breathtaking Hamlet and makes each Shakespeare play he touches new. His skill for breathing new life into classics is uncanny. See for yourself with his version of Cinderella is amazing. He embodies princes, villains, um, and we, so anyway, we invited Ken here today because he's featured in a few of Nolan's films, notably Dunkirk and Tenet, and can add some perspective about Nolan's vision. I urge you to go to the website and find the link to the bookstore to purchase a copy of the Nolan Variations. And if you appreciate our programs, please consider making a tax deductible contribution to keep these events going. Thank you. I'm so delighted to present Tom Schoen, Christopher Nolan, and Kenneth Branagh. Thank you, Andrea. Um, uh, gentlemen, thank you for, for joining us the, you know, today. Um, uh, I, uh, I should note just at the beginning that between Chris's CBE and Ken's OBE, I'm definitely the lowest ranking member on this, uh, on this panel. So I'm just lucky to be here. Um, uh, but I'd like to start with just with some congratulations. Um, uh, eight weeks at number one in the UK, Tenant has surpassed the international box office of Batman Begins by over 130 million. It has surpassed the box office of The Dark Knight in 18 yeah. countries. The film's taken 358 million globally so far in total and all in the middle of a global pandemic. So. Uh, Ken, I know you've been in the UK for the release there. Did you get to see it in the cinema? I did. I did. It was very, 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 very exciting. And uh, it was also exciting to be in a group of people. Uh, quite a, it was early doors, so it was, it was quite a lot of people, even in the socially distanced uh, uh, space in which I saw it. But there was a lot of excitement, as there always is with a, a film by, by Chris Nolan. But th this one had an extra edge to it. As, yeah, there was a tremendous air of genuine excitement about going to the cinema to see Tenet. Mm. You know, I once, uh, Anthony Minghella, the late Anthony Minghella, once told me how excited he was to work with uh, Walter Murch um, uh, because he said uh, he could grill him for information about how Francis Ford Coppola worked. Because um, he said the one problem with directing is that you never get to see how other people do it. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Ken, I'd like to ask you, as a director in your own right, what was it like to observe, you know, uh, you know, Chris at work? Uh, a privilege, because he's, uh, he's generous. I think yeah, your your book, uh, which I congratulate you on, it's a terrific, terrific achievement, and I, and Chris is so generous with his time and, and uh, insights in it. But one of the things that comes out of that is his enthusiasm um, for other people's work, which indicates. A sort of an openness, I would say. So that's what I experienced working with him. Um, the, uh, the the chance to be alongside the sort of level of concentration that he works at and Emma works at um, is very, very, very high and very intense. But he has 
which is pretty thrilling to be around. He has the combination of that kind of concentration, preparation, and confidence alongside the possibility to be open. I, I note this especially, you know, as a lucky performer in a couple of these films, because somehow I always compare in my mind someone like Chris to great sportsmen. It's interesting in the last week, Maradona, the great footballer, has um, uh, been gathered, as it were, in, in some of the footage that, that shows him in action, he does something and it's pertinent about Chris. It, it seems as though Maradona in full flight can slow down time. He moves quicker than other people and then he can find time to take time in the middle of a hectic moment in a football game to do something extraordinary as if suddenly he has moved into a parallel time um, sort of uh, tunnel, <laughs> slow motion. In working with Poland, what, what I understood was he could be in the middle of the chaos of Dunkirk or, or Tenet, or seeming chaos. In fact, it was all fantastically well planned, but obviously there are surprises. He could be in the middle of that and still give the attention to the scene and to the actors, I'm lucky enough to say, as if he was slowing down time to let us have our moment. That particular piece of Chris Nolan magic, I shall be grateful for, for, for all my days. Wow. Chris, you know, uh, to you as well, you know, um, what is it like to have, you know, to direct with another director on set? Um, you know, is it, does, has it ever helped? I mean, is it self-conscious making or? It's, uh, I mean, to, to be honest, it's something I've scrupulously avoided up until Dunkirk when I invited Ken to come and come and join us. And uh to be to be honest, it, it was a sort of mixture of things. You, you get a little self-conscious suddenly with another great director, and of course, I would say another great director. So for me to say a great director on my set, and um, one of the things I noticed is, you know, we were out on on the mole in Dunkirk with these fabulous Panaflex sixty-five millimeter cameras that everyone on the set is always so impressed with. It's like, oh, you're shooting large format, this five perk. You know, these cameras haven't been used since you know whenever. And at some point, as I realized that, you know, Ken had, had used the same camera to shoot Hamlet, you know, many years before, way, way before I was ever thinking of doing it. It was a sort of humbling thing to realize, yeah, to him, that's kind of, you know, old hat, something he's been doing a long time. Um, as far as was it helpful, uh, very specifically with, with Dunkirk and then ongoing, uh, it was extraordinarily helpful because the, the physical situation we had on that film was, we were shooting at the end of, of that very long pier-like structure called the Mole, where we had we built, you know, an extra piece of it on the existing foundations. Um, and, you know, it's really only about six feet wide. And so we had the whole crew sort of strung along. We're shooting in all directions, so you, there's nowhere to hide. Um, you know, we had the crew wearing uniforms and stuff so they could duck in with the rest of the soldiers. Um, but I'll put it this way, there was nowhere for the stars of the film to go and sit, take a break, or even frankly have a pee. Uh, and I think that having Ken there, who as a director, he could see immediately what we were dealing with in terms of the physicality. To take any kind of break was a, you know, a 20 minute walk down the structure and then, and then back. And, and we were sort of desperately trying to catch things as they, as they happen. Um, it was a huge help to have somebody who innately understood all of the other pressures I was dealing with uh, and he just stood there uh, as stoically as the character does in the film, quite, quite frankly. Uh, it was a huge, huge help to us, and I'm very, very grateful for it. Um, and then on, on Tenet, similarly, um, just working with extremely complicated situations in which, you know, as Ken, you were talking about, sort of trying to find that space to be able to discuss the scene and so forth. Um, I think, I don't know how aware, Ken, you are of this or whatever, but... but as a director, as well as an actor, um, you're never tugging me on the sleeve at the wrong moment. There's never this sort of moment of, you know, when something's about to explode or, you know, a helicopter's coming in or whatever it is. There's never, never that thing that you sometimes get just at the wrong moment. You're like, oh, by the way, you know, do you want the, the green or the red handkerchief in my pocket or, you know, whatever. Um, I think there's just a, just a, a, a very grace, gracious and graceful understanding of the pressures I'm dealing with. It's a, a huge help help to me, other than the fun of just working with someone who's just a, a great, uh, just an incredible actor and incredible incredible person to collaborate with. I was I was going to say in terms of the 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 different roles that Ken that you played in Dunkirk and then back to back with uh, with Tenet, I I can't think of another pivot as as sharp as that. 
Chris, in your work, where you've asked an actor to play literally, uh, you know, a, a character as, as, as opposing, you know, as different from the one he's played before. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of the scariest I've seen you, and you've played some villains. Um, but, uh, you know, how did you, Chris, how did you, when you approached uh, Ken with the part, how did you sort of pitch it to him? Do you say, okay, forget what you did with Dunkirk, this is the opposite? Well, I think with, with somebody like, like Kenneth Branagh, you don't, you don't have to do that. It's, it's taken as read that certainly on the stage, he's always been free to, to do anything he wants and has the skill to do anything he wants. I think in film, as the camera gets closer and closer and it becomes more and more a photographic reality that's sort of preserved, um, people tend to get pigeonholed a bit more. Um, but, but I had seen um, Oliver Parker's film of Othello years ago where uh, Ken played Iago. And, you know, that's a stunning performance as a, as a villain as you'll ever see. And, and the clarity of intention of, of that character, uh, it was really, really quite wonderful. Um, so I never had any, it wasn't a question of, of, you know, needing to, to, um, think about, okay, is, is this an actor capable of doing this? Because obviously Ken can do anything. For me, it was really a process of, of conversation with Ken about the nature of this particular type of villain. And what I did worry about a bit, and we talked about it a lot is, um, say to you know he uh, there just aren't any redeeming qualities to the man um he's he's a true thug and i think that's that's a very hard thing to play uh, very often with villains there's there's a flourish to them there's what ken talked about as a poetry to them there's something in their soul that's a dark reflection of heroism or so forth and you know with this character it was like no there's there's none of that this is this is primal thuggish sort of uh horrible stuff um, and uh, if you're lucky enough to get, get to know Ken, you realize that it couldn't be anything further from who he is as a person. Um, and I don't, I don't think he had much fun doing it, was my sense, at least emotionally. Is that true? Well, uh, no, I, it, was, it, was, it was a fascinating character to play. But I, I knew that, that Chris had, had that feeling that he's just articulated so well, because when I went out, it was a, a week or so ahead of, of shooting. We'd met a couple of times before then. We'd had a chance to rehearse a little bit in Los Angeles with John David and Elizabeth Debicki and, and Robert Pattinson. And um, when I went to Tallinn in Estonia, Chris it was on a Sunday afternoon and Chris was in the middle of this scene where an auditor auditorium was filled with, I don't know, three and a half thousand real people and then an orchestra of three or four hundred uh, then a, 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 a terrorist attack, as it would seem to be, was being filmed. So guns, stuntmen, action, danger. It was walking onto that set was electrifying. It was very, very, very exciting. We, I was uh, offering up Chris the chance to see what the hair and makeup people had done with some hair color and all the rest of it, see if this was what he wanted. And so we had that brief conversation and I imagined it would be, you know, 30 seconds because goodness me, his hands were full. And then, and then when we said, uh, he said, okay, that, that's, that's, that's fine. We said whatever it was. And I started to walk back to the, um, to the unit, which was some distance away. And, and Chris started to walk with me. And I felt at the beginning of the conversation, I wanted to say, no, 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 you don't, no, you need to be, you really need to be back there. But it began a conversation which was, a, was, a, was about absolutely underlining what he wanted from Sator. And, and I think making sure that I did not get caught out by something you write a lot about in the book, which is fascinating, I think, in terms of the, what you might call the sort of interest in the Faustian strands in certain characters in Chris's films who have made big bargains with some other force, where you might call it some, some sort of supernatural agency, you might call it the future, you might call it the past, you might call it time or whatever. And I was very intrigued by something that Chris had written in this brilliant script about, about, about Sato having made a devil's bargain, which mm. I think, and when people see the film, they'll understand that it is a sort of extraordinary accommodation he makes with the, with the past and the future, if you like. Um, uh, and, and in that, I suppose I did see some kind of uh, dark poetry or something, uh, but, but I think it was, 
it, it was definitely something that, that uh, I felt. And that walk, that long walk from the very busy set really made me understand that it was important to Chris that one shouldn't go down some, too sort of Florida path in that way, because as true as that might be of the character and what he did and how important that, that sort of handshake with the devil was, it did not remove this essentially black thuggish center almost soulless quality so i was grateful for the long walk because it really underlined what i needed to do but i really really enjoyed also it drove me back to read goethe's faust um uh, and uh, I, but but stopped myself getting too carried away with any poetry but but I, it was so clear and i mean he managed to do that and go back and direct the, the rest of the brilliant scene but i was i was so happy to understand how much it meant to him it really i knew that it meant something it wasn't just you know, it, it was important that I, I got the message and I did, and I was really grateful for it. It was, it was very strong advanced direction. So just to get, just to clarify, you, uh, you, after that conversation, uh, were inspired to go back and, and, and dig out Faust. Is that as a result? Because I, God, I wish I'd known that. That, that would have gone straight in. Um, well, I, I did, but it was, it was only in a way to, to, to sort of satisfy an interest in part of what Chris had created at the same time as also putting it away, um, almost like almost like the secret bit of Sator that nobody would see. So it yeah, became yeah. Was very good for me internally, but was not part of the sort of playing mechanism, I think. Uh, it was one of those ones where I would, you know, Chris would work out how much or how little of that he wanted to come out and would guide me accordingly, which he did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, talking to you now. It's 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 making me realize that you know the the brief of this uh, book was very much it was you know based on interviews with Chris, and therefore I was paying a lot of attention to the parts of the filmmaking process that are most under his control, which is to say you know the writing and the editing and the sound and so on. Um, you know, but there are also such great performances in his films. Um, you know, uh, one thinks immediately of Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. You know, but also I'm a big fan of Rebecca. Paul and the Prestige and, uh, you know, Guy Pearce and Memento. I mean, th th these are kind of great per performances. Um, uh, you know, Chris, I don't want you to, to pick any sort of favorites, um, but I wonder if you could talk me through a little bit about your kind of learning process with actors. It's one of the things that all directors have to do at some point is learn mm -hmm. how to collaborate with actors. Um, you know, uh, what have been the, the, the sort of, if you like, the key points of that for you? Well, I mean, that's one of the things I love about filmmaking. That is an ongoing process for me and working with actors and new actors I hadn't worked with before and finding new ways to work with actors and, and seeing them work in different ways. Um, that's part of the, the joy of filmmaking for me. So it's an ongoing process. But two things I would point to sort of early on, um, I had a very striking moment with Guy Pearce on Memento where he he's... He was performing a scene of um, uh, emotional intensity, uh, and it, 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 he, he gets very up, upset in the, in the scene. And um, we got to his close-up, and we were running late, and it was my first sort of budgeted film. And as luck would have it, the financier of the film was standing behind me as we were shooting guys close-up. Just came to visit set, you know, was sort of standing in the background. The clock was ticking. Um, Guy did a fantastic take and I was like, you know, I came up to him and I said, that's great, we've got it, um, you know, we should move on, you know, or we have it. And he's like, I'm not sure where I have it. And I'm, you know, and he, and he sort of, he seemed a little, not annoyed with me, but a little short with me. There was a sort of moment of, um, I, I think I could do something else, you know, I don't think we've, we've got it. And I sort of had that moment of like, okay, well, what do I do now? Because this is my job and my, you know, my, do I convince him to it? And in the end, I was just sort of, I, I felt a bit cornered and I was like, okay, let's just do another take. And um, the next take, Guy did what, what actors do, not the whole time, but from time to time. It, it did a transcendent take. It did a take that wasn't acting anymore. It was just this other plane of, of performance and not performance and just being and or truth and I hadn't really seen that before and it was sort of a very striking thing and 
I remember realizing at that moment that the one thing you don't ever want to do is move on at the wrong time. You don't ever want to let the time, you know, it takes so long to set up each shot. There's so many other things going into it with the lighting and um, the, the dolly work and, you know, all, all the things that go into that. Like once you're there, see what, what the actor can do, see where it can go. And it was a, it was a huge sort of learning, learning moment. Um, a point to that. And then I also had a, I had a sort of extraordinary experience um, directing Al Pacino on, on Insomnia um, because he, he was in every scene of the film almost, almost entirely. So he worked every day and, you know, this legend of, of, a, of an actor, just sort of every day you were learning sort of more and more. But that, that moment that I had seen with, with Guy and I've, and I've seen in a lot of actors since, um, it's a sort of peak of, I call it some kind of transcendence that, that an actor can hit every now and again, once a week maybe, or you know, whatever. Um, and I would watch Pacino do that all the time and sustain it for hours in a way that I just was, was shocking to, to witness. Um, just an incredible level of, of craft. And to be able to talk to him you know, every day and, and see how he was sort of arriving and getting in tune with, with what that meant, um, that just taught me an, incredible amount about um, acting and what it can be, but also to watch, you know, on that film we had the great Robin Williams, we had Hilary Swank, extraordinary actress. Um, they each had an incredibly different process. But what you saw is the way that great actors, when you do the two shots, for example, you know, when they're having to accommodate each other, great actors have this amazing way of just sort of combining their processes or letting their process fall to the side as need be or whatever in order to, to come together for the, the moment of that. And that was an incredible, incredible thing to, to watch. It really just uh, increased my fascination with, with acting. And, and uh, you know, I'm not an actor myself and I've never done it and I've never studied it. So for me, every time I make a film, I'm just learning and, and being amazed by what these great performers can, can bring to what it is that I'm trying to do. You know, it's making me think very much of, you know, some of the, the best screen acting uh, can be very simple and very minimal. Um, and uh, and it's, it, I, I think here, Ken, you know, your uh, delivery of the line home in Dunkirk, it stands out for me. Um, because in that moment, when you deliver that line or, or word even, you're doing more than just sort of delivering a line, you're almost delivering the heart of the movie. Um, you know, was that something, can you remember shooting that scene that were, you know, when you shot that, you know, how you, how you got there? Like, how did you end up with that? Well, I remember what, what Chris was describing so vividly about, about the mole itself meant that we had these unusual moments, which were um, of great concentration where, uh, because we could, you know, ask people to step back a bit, then you'd suddenly find that there was, Chris and myself, James Darcy, Matthew Marsh, actors in, in, the, in those scenes as well, were suddenly up that end of the mold. So you're a long way from the beach. You're, a, you're out on a promontory. You're isolated. There's something, and it was so elemental that mm -hmm. you, you felt as though even, even getting ready for it, you're in a sort of Greek play or something. It was, you were already in some sort of amphitheater. And because you knew you were on the sort of ribs of what had happened, um, there originally, I, you could never lose this very shiver down the spine feeling that was trying to, uh, um, you know, convey the enormity of, of uh, something profound and simple like these, these, these boats appearing over the horizon. What Chris is a master at in moments like that was just allowing us to be there at the end, stopping time, as I mentioned, seeming to suddenly all of that, all the noise and the chaos, and just, and, and sort of, finding a way around it, not trying to trick you. You were part of the conversation, but of course he was directing. Of course, he might have had very, very specific things in mind, but the conversation feels authentic. It is, it's, it's unpressurized at the same time as understanding as an as a intelligent, very you know, brilliant artist that this is an important moment in the movie, but they all are, are there no casual moments. So he doesn't overplay it but he gives it its time. And it just feels like, I, I felt with something like that, we, we, you know, everybody was doing it together. The other people in the scene, Hoyter's cinematographer, it was a key moment for a lot of 
people, Nilo getting the, the, the you know, all the, all the background action ready. Everything was so key. And I felt, I, I, I felt as though pressure was taken off me, but I was also being watched by somebody very precise. So I, I would have to be, you know, as good as I could possibly be because they were all going to be and we recognized it was an important moment. You couldn't let that moment down, but also, but it wasn't, weirdly wasn't pressurized. The goal was just, the goal was to make the thing as good as it could be, but it wasn't so much about failure and success. It was just, what can you get out of that, out of that, out of that moment? And what, what is at the heart of it? What is authentic about it? And finding the ability to do that, to concentrate, you, you one dares to say sort of the, the art of it, you, you know, was really fantastic to, to, to have that, as I say, time-stopping thing. And one thing I'd just say about what Chris has said about acting, in watching following, I think also Chris had amazing taste and natural judgment about acting from the, from the get-go. I think the acting in following from, from actors who were much less experienced than some of the great ones that he's quoted was an example of, 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 of your taste, Chris, in terms of there's no fass, faff, there's no, there's no what we can always be guilty of, which is schmacting. There's no extra stuff in there. There's no, there's no extra bits, you know. It's so lean, it's so economic, it's so um, uh, sort of essential. And you get that. They're, they're terrific performances from all of those actors in that. And that, that has to be already, I think, some, somewhere in your DNA, uh, a sort of, a, a basically, a, a kind of radar for the truth, which is really, you know, impressive. Well, on, on that film, we, um, as Tom talks about in the book, um, we were forced to rehearse the entire film like a stage play because we only, we shot every weekend and we would do one scene at a time. And so I would get together with Jerry and Lucy, and Alex, and, and we would just workshop it like it was a play. And, and I've, I've never worked in the theater, but it was just so that they, we could then go into a restaurant or whatever that we got for a couple hours and they would just perform it and we had, Everything in that film, uh, to the credit of those those great uh, actors, you know, that's first takes or second takes, that's it, because that's all we had. Um, so they had to know it, know it. So we got to explore it a lot in advance. The difference with the Pacino experience was we hadn't had any time to rehearse. So we were doing it on set, which was a scary thing in itself. I and mean, we, because it was a writer's strike, I mean, we literally had had no rehearsal. So it was turning up on set every day and trying to fit that into the, the process. Um, you, you left out, Ken, a, a key part of that, uh, that answer to, to Tom's question about home and that, that moment is that, you know, when you came aboard the project, that line wasn't there. It didn't exist. And, and when Ken read the script, he sort of said to me, you know, see what you're going for, because it was a very, sort of, you know, it's a very nonverbal film. And so I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to sort of say something in that moment. I wanted it to, to all be kind of nonverbal. And, and you know, Ken's point was, it needs something. It needs just some articulation, just something. I think he felt, you know, as an actor, somebody just grab a hold of. And, and um, you know, I didn't, I didn't give you a whole line. I only gave you one word, but it, was, <laughs> it made all the difference. And that's the beauty of, of film collaboration. That's the fun of it. What I love about working with actors and working with really intelligent actors is they read the script and they come at it from a very different angle than anyone else who's going to read it for you. Um, because they're living it in a different way. And you, you, you learn to listen to that and to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out how to make that work better for, the, for the, the actor who's analyzing the script from that different point of view. And so that, that became a, you know, a very, very important moment because I think the moment in the film is unthinkable without the line. And so thank you for that. Chris, where are you, when you, give me an idea of where you are when you're shooting. Um, where are you in relation to the actors and the camera? Where, where do you like to be once? Uh, I that? like to be as close to the camera as possible, as close to the actors as possible. So I don't sit behind a monitor. I, for years, I've had a sort of little UHF monitor that I just hang around my neck so I can check framings and sort of check what's going on if I need to look at it that way. Um, and I try to be, you know, sort of right there experiencing it because what, what I learned also um, in, in working with Pacino, um, it's an interesting point. I, you know, I, um, I came up to him after one take and gave him a note and he said to me, I've already, I'm, I'm happy to do it again, but I've already done that for you. You can't see it on the monitor. You can't really even see it to eye. You'll see it in dailies. 
And I sort of thought, yeah, right, thanks, mate. You know, uh, and then sure enough, the next day, projecting the film, I saw exactly what I had wanted and the, the layer I had asked for. And that always sort of taught me that you're never going to be able to sit on a monitor. Um, you've got to be as close as you can. And even then, you're not really seeing it. You're, you're getting close to it, but you're not really seeing it. So we also then, you know, project dailies as soon as we can. But so I like to just try and, and be there as much as possible. Also, because I view camera placement and um, that the whole mise en scène, you know, to me, it's, it's all about three dimensions. So it's all about physically where you want the camera to be in relation to the, what's going on. Is that the, I mean, you're one of the few directors that does uh, watch dailies. Is that why? Is that the beginnings of that particular working habit? Or is do we doing that anyway? Well, when I when I started on, um, you know, call it Hollywood movies, you know, when I when I started on movies with an actual budget, everybody watched dailies. I mean, it was it was a requirement of the job. It wasn't a choice, um, and you immediately felt the value of it through things like the story I've just told. But but in everything else, you you always felt the sense of camaraderie. Um, you know, with your department heads, you're sitting there, you're watching the images that you already have achieved. So it's a huge morale boost at the end of the day because you've been shooting some other scene and struggling with it, feeling like you don't have enough time and not getting everything you want. And then you get to see something you've already done, you know, that generally, you know, you'd be quite happy with the way it comes up. Not always, but, you know, there's, it's a bit of candy. It's a bit of a treat at the end of the day, quite frankly. And it helps you gradually steer the ship because a, a production is a, it's like an oil tanker. It doesn't, it doesn't spin on a dime. You have to sort of, gradually shape things with your collaborators as you're seeing what you you shot unfold and who are you watching them with everybody and the cast and crew i mean who comes to the to, to, to see them i generally we just open it up to the uh, heads of department so i don't generally invite actors to come and watch it and most wouldn't necessarily be interested um i've always worried that it would it would perhaps make the actors self-conscious or think of things in the wrong way so i Early on, I decided to not do that, but I watch with my director of photography, my editor, sound. I mean, every, everybody who wants to costume uh, continuity. We really have a, a big group in there um, because I think over the years, everybody started to feel that that's where a lot of the decisions get made. Because even though you're not going back to do stuff, mm -hmm. it's informing how you're going to carry on. And it's also showing everybody what it is I have in my head, or, you know, how, it, how it's what the emphasis is, what the tone of things is. You know, one of the, Ken, one of the surprises uh, for me, you know, uh, working on this book and I invited, you know, Chris to give me notes uh, for it and to you know, tell me his thoughts um, was to your point, exactly how good a collaborator he is. Um, I don't know why I wasn't expecting it, but it was a surprise anyway. Um, and I sort of found that he would give me notes that rather that he in which he sounded less like the subject of the book trying to make himself look good and more like a sort of editor or reader of the book who was giving me advice that would make me look good um and for that you know i'm you know very grateful uh you know i wondered you know i mean is that your experience too as an actor like kind of what what it's like to kind of get into the sandpit with him so to speak um uh, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, for what it's worth, that I that I really noticed and valued about the book is that that uh, it's it felt like a very sort of honest collaboration. So it's very thorough, very rigorous. I really, it's also quite playful. I think in the sense that I really enjoy, um, you know, your exercise having having that group of people watch Tootsie in order to, you know, consider a, a different. That was a fascinating sort of experiment into rom-com time and all the things that are part of what many people talk about when they talk about uh, Chris's movies or indeed that um, you know the, 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 it's, it's really quite touching and rather moving the conversation that you appear to you both appear to have about about how one orientates oneself left hand to right hand all the way through to, to the end of the book is a very very touching thing uh, as is as is uh, and you proved it to me as far as I'm concerned uh, it seems that you know uh, Phones have indeed made us lose our sense of direction. Um, <laughs> that's, now, that's now officially proved by Mr. Nolan and Mr. Sean in this book, I think. So, so yeah, I, I would say that, that um, and also what I valued about this book was that um, 
I think it's it's uh, if I could use it, it's ballsy of 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 Chris to uh, you know meet a, 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 a you know a, a, a smart analyst of, of of this kind of work and um, you, you know sort of it, it collaborate to have a conversation. I think that this sense of a live conversation is key in the work, and that also what what I admire in what Chris does is that there's a there's a search for some kind of truth. That is not about how good he can look. It's not about the the ego of the of him. It's about it's about how how can you do the thing best. It seems to connect to other things. It seems to have interesting th things that have been and things that will be. So that there's a sort of um, an ongoing conversation about about the, the the work. And at the same time, I felt as though I learned really quite a lot. And I thought you were super honest, uh, Chris, in terms of, uh, for me, it was an inspiring thing to hear somebody talking about. And I know exactly the way in which you meant it, it, it at least it seemed to me, which is that, um, you know, approaching a film as if you, that you're assuming that you're going to make the best film that was ever made, because why, why would you do it? Why would you do it otherwise? Why, why would you do it? And of course, so when you're on a Chris Nolan set, without arrogance, that seems to be what's happening. With confidence, but no arrogance. That's, i.e., it matters that much. It matters that much to try and do something that well. Um, and which is not to say that other things aren't great, because there are so many mentions here of, of whether it's Woody Allison's performance in Kingpin or whatever, all the other things that we might, that we everybody might enjoy across the culture. Um, then nevertheless, a sort of a pride in doing it the best one can, you know, and and and. And, and expecting it to be at the highest possible level without that needing to be a, you know, a, a conquistador at work. That, that, that I think is, that's, that's, a, that's a, I would say that's a mature artist at work. That was my experience. Hmm. I mean, that was, so you, I mean, you've hit on definitely the quality that, um, that I responded to, you know, in Chris's work a lot, which is the sort of playfulness. Um, uh, you know, it's, Ken, it's actually making me think of <clears throat> your comment about Tenet being a, a kind of cinematic Rubik's Cube, you know. Um, uh, and Chris, I, I wondered what your thoughts on this are, because I know that the, the, the idea of kind of movie as puzzle has kind of dogged you a little bit, and it's kind of, to some extent, you agree with it, to some extent, you don't. Um, but the aspect of it that maybe I think kind of is, so does bear up, is this idea of a kind of, the, of of a game entered into by the audience and the filmmaker? There's a, there's a kind of game going on. It's play. There's a, there's something playful, even in movies as as dark as as the Dark Knight. That's the quality that I you know I I, I respond to anyway, and I think kind of fans of your 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 films do. Well, I mean, as you talk about it, it, it occurs to me that one of the phrases I find myself using most often in the edit suite and on set, uh, well, at all stages, is letting the audience in on the joke. You know, when we're talking about clarity, that tends to be the phrase I use. It's like, we're gonna let them in on the joke. We're gonna let them, you know. the, the thing about, you know, when you talk about movies as puzzle, if it, if it sounds like medicine, if it sounds like hard work or, you know, a test or something, or, uh, I'm not a big fan of crossword puzzles. I don't do crossword puzzles. And whenever one of my films in a review is compared to a crossword puzzle, I feel I fail slightly because um, I don't really enjoy doing crosswords. Uh, so, uh, for me, it's about if you, if a film, if an if as an audience member, if I could be made to feel an understanding of something, if I can be made to feel a little bit ahead of something or a little bit, as I say, in on the joke, then I really enjoy that experience, and I want to give that. You know, that's what I want as an audience member. That's what I'm trying to do as a filmmaker. Um, mm. There's not much point in a filmmaker sort of lording it over the audience in terms of complexity or, or structure and so forth, because. You know, I've got years and years to make this film and, you know, the audience has two and a half hours to watch it, two hours to watch it. So it's, it's, there's no level playing field there. Uh, so I do, that partly makes me feel a responsibility to make a, a dense and complete experience. Um, but it also means for me that, that my primary impulse as a filmmaker is to try and, and narratively entertain, try and have a flow, try and pull the audience through an experience, first and foremost. And then if there are more layers to that, more complexity to that, um, that's fine. But in that, that first experience, you want to be trying to bring people along that and let them in on the joke. Yeah. I mean, that hits on something that I think is, I've noticed with your films is um, the experience in the cinema uh, is visceral and consuming. Uh, but the thing that I've noticed about 
your movies is that they have this strange afterlife. You know, like it, I, I think you never stop watching them. In other words, they have this kind of echo. Uh, the film stops, but it doesn't really, it carries on. Um, and so there's this kind of wonderful stickiness, you know, like kind of, uh, uh, you know, we wander around afterwards, just trying to sort of, you know, uh, they, they, they linger. There's a, and I wondered if there was any, you know, the, the best effects like that, obviously are not things you kind of calculate, but I wondered if there was, if this had any kind of correlation to like the way that you come up with them. I mean, uh, you know, this idea of something that just sort of lingers, that just sort of echoes, that you just can't get out of your your mind, or you know, like, can't stop thinking. Is that is that how you actually approach? Do they begin like that? I mean, not not in any conscious sense. I, I do remember feeling with Memento, for example, that that I was chafing against the, the what I call the sort of tyranny of the, the film running through the projector, that linear thing, trying to trying to create. A, an experience that would bleed out of that and be more three-dimensional. It, a lot of it comes down to dimensional thinking. It's like wanting something to be three-dimensional or two-dimensional. Um, you know, wanting to have a life beyond what's literally on, on that screen, using the series of shots to suggest a world in, in the mind because the, the way that our brains piece together shot by shot by shot is a fascinating thing. We do build a three-dimensional space from uh, individual shots in, in films. Um, I, the, the example that sort of struck me is, you know, the certain sort of David Lynch films, thinking of Lost Highway in particular, where my experience with watching that film was, I was very frustrated with that film as I was watching it. I, I was bored by it, I was frustrated by it. I, I couldn't figure out what he was trying to do with it. Um, I finished watching it, put it to one side. And then about a week later, I found myself remembering that film as if it were one of my own dreams when realizing that, that however he had done it, and I'm sure it's instinctive, not conscious, he had found a mechanism to sort of give you the, the model of that experience that would grow in your mind and, and assume the sort of surreality of mm. memory of, of a dream experience. And, and it's, it's a film I sort of remember much more fondly than, than as I was actually watching it. But I think it's a really great experience. And I think to different degrees, any film can do that and should try to do that. But I think it has to be instinctive somehow. It just has to be there mm -hmm. in, in thinking of things in a, I suppose, a three-dimensional way. You know, I think this kind of goes to, you know, one of the central conflicts of your filmmaking, which is on the one hand, um, uh, you know, between the conscious mind and then if you like the unconscious, the random, the, the, the intuitive, the, 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 and that is that kind of goes through all your your films, which are very kind of you know they're very patterned and very controlled. At the same time, you know there's the Joker. You know uh, at the same time there's this kind of love of kind of randomness and uh, and you know filmmaking can itself be you know a kind of random process. How, how, I wonder how you kind of get. I mean, I, how do you kind of dethrone your control of a film? Do you know what I'm trying to get at here? Like kind yeah, of- Yeah, no, I, I, I do. Um, I mean, I think the process itself, if you embrace it uh, in a particular way or the, the way I do, you are bringing in all kinds of elements. When you talk about the Joker, um, you know, my brother wrote the first screenplay of The Dark Knight and you know, there was a lot still to be finished. I did a lot of work on the script myself afterwards, but the thing that he brought 100% was the character of the Joker. I read that draft of the script and it, it was there and it was incredibly precise. And you saw exactly, you know, I, I had asked for it to be, the character to be this kind of engine of the film, but I didn't know how he was going to do that. And he came back with this, this extraordinary character. And, and that's how sort of, yes, I'm sort of giving marching orders in terms of what I want from the, the thing or what the ultimate effect is. Or, you know, when I'm talking to Ken about Sator and how it has to be this thuggish sort of thing, but, but the way in which he's going to achieve that, you know, I mean, the scene where, where Sator kind of tells us, explains to John David what he's going to do to him, you know, physically, um, you know, I had, I, I was very keen for Ken to play that. Um, I think if you remember, Ken was going to have a bunch of, crabs, you used to be eating crabs legs or something, it would be butter over and it'd be this kind of sort of slightly voracious sort of thing. And, and Ken just quietly kept saying, no, I'm not, 
I don't want any of that, you know. And in the end, played the scene utterly the opposite of what I had in mind, uh, and and with a stillness that's much more threatening than any of the kind of flamboyance I was suggesting or mess that I was suggesting would have, would have done. And, and that's how, you know, part of being a filmmaker, part of the joy of being a filmmaker is to be able to, you know, give up control of certain things. I think you have to have a plan and you have to have an idea of how you want it to be. But then people, they throw these things in, you know, whether it's my brother or Emma or Hoiter or, you know, or the actors or, you know, things start coming in that, change what that can be and if you're open to that hmm. uh, i think that's the the most important aspect of that ken where did you uh when you when you think of kind of cinematic villainy uh who are your sort of who are the benchmark performances for you you know where, where, who who's played the best villains well you, you just mentioned one heath ledger as, as, as the joker and uh, tom hardy in dark knight rises is uh, is magnificent I, I, a couple of I, a couple of things I, I would uh, respond to regarding what you've just talked about this 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 lingering effect uh, with Chris's movies. I find one of the things the book I think was very illuminating about was um, understanding, and I hadn't really quite understood how far back some of the ideas go. You know, I remember you telling me about it, but that trip to Dunkirk with you and Emma that you know was whatever it was twenty years previously it seemed as though there were other connections with movies that went further back you know where the and, and also the time you spend writing scripts or sometimes the 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 um the way the the the, the writing process develops it means that, that that i think from those who work with chris when you arrive uh what, what he he describes as a plan i would describe as mastery so he's he arrives with that and that's also the longevity of a of, a, of an idea cooking and in and in the cooking it is more flavorsome somehow so it's more sort of pungent so he has he has that um there is this ability to to to, to respond on the day to embrace the happy accident or create the happy accident or or run with the happy accident or the the you know would be inspiration of, of other people and then the other thing i think that that um explains that lingering factor which you talk a lot about in the book and again was very illuminating to me was the musicality in in chris's films not just the extraordinarily innovative use of musical techniques but the detail of them so i think that you know music going beyond words as it does touching the soul in in these 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 these, these numinous ways uh when it's as packed with detail in the approach as chris's films are it means you literally there are voices in your head as a result of what you saw viscerally and experienced in the cinema, but they're going to stay whether you're watching on a small device or watching it on a on a on a on a great DVD master years down the line. So there's there is a, there's such artistry in 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 all of it. I think. I couldn't have put it better, Ken. Um, I, I wish you'd written the book. Um, we should probably. Uh, I, yeah, it's so I, much as I wish we could really sort of push on the next couple of hours. We should probably um, invite in some. Um, some, um, some questions from the audience. Uh, I think Andrea can, um, can uh, help out. I'm back, thank you so much. Um, I wanna welcome people from Europe and India today. Apparently we have um, quite a great representation uh, internationally, so that's wonderful. Uh, let's start out with a question uh, from a comedy person. What's a silly, uncinematic movie that you love? Let's address that to Chris and to Ken. Gosh, I mean, I'm I'm a fan of comedy, and for some reason that always surprises people. I guess because my films are a bit serious, um, <laughs> and I uh, I've, I've developed a sort of um, reputation for being a big fan of MacGruber, which is is definitely a silly film that I am a big fan of. Uh, but uh, I would all, I mean, there's so many, but uh, Talladega Nights is a great, great favorite of mine. And I would say, I would say Naked Gun um, for, uh, for, you know, s s just slapstick, but just brilliant. Yeah, just fall over funny, just tickle, but tickle bone funny uh, for me. So, uh, Chris, would you ever do a movie that's a comedy? Oh, they're all they're all comedies. 
<laughs> I, to be perfectly honest, uh, nothing frightens me more than the concept of doing a, doing a comedy. When I see what these these great comedic filmmakers are up against, in a way, you know, you could you put a couple of jokes in a in a in a serious film, and if they don't land, you, you just cut them out, or you know what what have you. you, you watch it with an audience if you don't get a laugh you sort of take it out the idea of of constructing an entire narrative that's totally at the mercy of the audience's you know comedic response to it uh it's an extraordinary thing that they do it's a real high wire act and i i admire it tremendously and wouldn't ever want to step into that arena uh, here's a here's a great question what would a shakespearean adaptation of yours look like gosh um, I'd yeah, be, bring Ken in. I was going to say, I'm not answering <laughs> this one in front of Fran. Uh, but uh, I, I think the great thing about Shakespeare, and I'm very interested to know what Ken would say in answer to that, but because he's done so many such varied adaptations, and to me, that makes that sort of explains why the, the question is so hard for me to answer because Shakespeare is so adaptable and so so different and varied in the approach you could take. So. Who knows, it could be anything really, but uh, interested to know what Ken would say. Well, I, I was fascinated because when, when we met you, you, when we talked about Dunkirk, you were kind enough to come and see a production of uh, Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, which we did yeah. in London. And the next morning, and before we started talking about Dunkirk, you talked for a long time about that play. And I found myself leaving your house thinking, of course, well, that was a perfect play for you know, Chris to watch because it's got a character called Time that opens the that opens the fourth act. There's a 16 year missing gap where the plot goes absolutely haywire. There are lost children and magic comes in at the end, you know. <laughs> and suddenly, I was, so I was, my mind was whirling with it's like the prestige crossed with um, uh, you know uh, any number of your parallel time kind of conceits. So, but you were really you. I remember you being very affected by the, the Winter's Tale and oh, yeah. very very sharp in analysing what Shakespeare was doing with a fairy tale in his maturity, deciding to use a relatively crude form to tell a story, a daft fairy tale format, to tell something that, that turned out to be quite profound. And it, I, it was great to hear you talk about it. Oh, it was an incredible experience. A um, really tremendous production. With, uh, I'm trying to remember who was in it. It was Judy Dench. And Judy Dench, for sure. Yeah, she was, yeah, yeah, she was phenomenal. Yeah, this wasn't a winter's tale on the bookshelf in Interstellar. I have to go back and watch it again. But, well uh, spotted, Tom, if that was the case. I was going to say, I, I think it was. I it think may, it, was. it may well have been, but not. I mean, I to be honest, I if I'm if I'm to be completely honest, my understanding of that play was transformed by Ken's production. I mean, I it I, it spoke to me in a way that it never had before. I mean, I was uh, you know we all know the exit pursued by a bear type bit, but it's the. <laughs> The whole package. I mean, what a what a phenomenal and very cinematic uh, production, actually, with a lot of underscore and a lot of a lot of very strong visuals. Uh, clearly, a film director and stage director at, at work. But uh, yeah, what a phenomenal production that was. Here's a question that um, both Chris and Ken can tackle. Um, in March, uh, Nolan wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post saying there's no more comforting thought than that we're all in this together, something the movie going experience has been reinforcing for generations. So how do you adapt your careers when the world seems to be moving towards the streaming world? Well, I think, uh, you know, one of the, the misconceptions, I think, you know, that this awful pandemic we're in and the time we're in, there's been a bit of a tendency in the in the business of Hollywood for people to talk about an acceleration of existing trends, and you see that being talked about in certain other industries that are struggling right now. Um, of course, they're struggling, um, as we all are in so many different ways. But um, you know, 2019 was the the biggest year ever for theatrical movie going uh, in terms of box office and in terms of admissions. It was very very high. It was the highest it's been since I think 1987, um, and so. I think longer term, uh, I'm a big believer in, in the future of theatrical film. Uh, I think, you know, all of the different opportunities available to filmmakers in terms of uh, what streaming can bring to it, what television can bring to it, whatever. I mean, 
I, they're incredible opportunities out there now. There's so many different ways for uh, storytellers to express themselves. That's a wonderful thing. For me personally, uh, I'm just a great lover of the communal experience, the, the large screen, uh, and I'm a big believer in its, uh, its long-term possibility. Yeah, and, and I, I, I draw, um, you know, huge heart from the experience of, uh, you know, w w watching Tenet from the from the back of the auditorium in a socially distanced but massively excited uh, audience that were so glad to to be there and be challenged and sort of as as Tom was saying, sort of viscerally engaged with this um, this story. So I I certainly share with Chris a, a belief that with even in the horrors of what so many people have had to live through in this pandemic, in terms of our tiny bit of the forest, as it were, I think the theatrical experience is still, uh, will, will turn out to be valued extremely highly. Um, here's one. Christianity has had a large impact on American culture and in Tenet, it appears you allude to it through the protagonist, the Seder Square and free will conversation. What influence would you say does Christianity have on your films? I mean, I think the, the influence of Christianity on my films is, is mostly cultural in terms of my upbringing. You know, I was raised Catholic. Uh, it, it's a lot of the cultural touch and a lot of what, what my education has been all the rest. Um, Christianity, ideas of Christianity sort of float around in there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think in, in a funny sort of way, Tenet, um, with the protagonist, John David and I talked about this character having an aspect of, we, we would not in any way specific to religion or Christianity, but in almost sort of spiritual terms, we talked about needing to have faith, uh, and the title of the film has that, that aspect to it. And um, that was very much a sort of... Um, uh, a subconscious thing, really, that I think both of us, as we approach material and we talk about what, what to do with it, we were looking for an aspect of selflessness to the character that in a previous spy fiction, and it's really a genre thing, you have these very cynical, hard-bitten protagonists. And it's a little bit at odds with the concept of somebody who, in story terms, is willing to give up their life for their fellow human being, fellow human beings. And so we were interested in... in looking at it in a slightly different way and, and thinking that there must be a selflessness, call it that, or some degree of spirituality to this, this character. And I think John David, it was really a question of not so much putting it in the script as, as having him uh, play the character with this sort of, I suppose you, you call it, a, I guess, a generosity of spirit that you don't normally see in those characters. And I think, I think it gave it an interesting dimension. Uh, but beyond that, I would say Christianity is just a, a cultural influence um, as it is for for so many people growing up in Western culture. Um, one second. Um, the Dark Knight is the greatest superhero film of all time. Did you foresee that it would become such a universal political touchstone for both, for both the Bush administration and Obama administrations? They both used it to explain their responses to dealing with terrorism. Well, I have been asked a lot about the, the, the politics of, of those films. Uh, and I said to Tom, you know, in, in, the, in the book, he addresses this. Uh, we talked about it a lot. And, and I think the thing I would sort of come back to is that if you've, if you've made something, and the films are not intended to be political in any kind of specific sense, and the fact that they were sort of, you know, hijacked a little bit by both the right and the left, sort of almost in equal measure, <laughs> Uh, makes me feel that we probably did our job right because the films are not intended to be political. They're intended to be, um, you know, uh, I suppose frightening in some ways and make you think about certain things or things that you'd be worried about in society. And we tried to write from a sincere point of view, but we didn't want specific politics to them. So when they're, um, you know, held up in that way, the fact that it comes from both sides, I think means, means, uh, you know, perhaps that we did our job right. You know, having said which, it was pretty thrilling to hear uh, Obama talk about, <laughs> talk about the Dark Knight in relation to his approach to terrorism. That was quite a striking thing. Uh, that, that definitely made us feel like, okay, we've, uh, you know, we definitely uh, 
achieve the degree of pop culture prominence that we never imagined possible with that interpretation of Batman. Uh, you cover fantasy, superhero, action, thrillers, history, spy films, and science, uh, spy stories, and science fiction. In your view, what's the most difficult genre to translate to film? Well, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. I, I think comedy has to be it. I mean, I, I think it's the one genre I look at and I think, no way. You know, I mean, I, I look at what these, these great comedy filmmakers have to do to sort of conceive of something, tune it, make it work, you know, for not for a live audience, but for audiences all over the world and for, for years to come. Uh, I think it's by far the hardest genre. Uh, let's, I think you've covered much. Oh, there was a question about music. Um, how do you deal with your, your composers are all, you, you use different composers, many different composers, but how do you sit down and talk to your composers to get across the feeling that it's a Christopher Nolan film because they all seem to have a similar feel, the scores? Well, I think if, if they have a similar feel, it's probably due to um, my enjoyment of getting very involved with, with the music and working with great, talented people like Dave Julian and, and Hans Zimmer and um, uh, Ludwig Göransson. Uh, I, it's not trying to impose some kind of style. And I think the scores are varied through the film in very interesting, through the films have made in very interesting ways. Uh, and I feel really privileged to of worked with these these great artists um, but I do try and get very involved with them and try and really give them a sense of the, the feeling that I'm looking for so um, in a sense I suppose I become this kind of focal point of, of what they're doing and, and I'm pushing things in a particular way or pulling them in a particular way that's somewhat personal to me uh, but the other thing that these these great artists have is they're terrific collaborators since they're really trying to, to make it work for the, the film and the way the film needs to work. I think uh, it's we're coming to the end, but uh, how about one last question here? Um, you seem to be continually asking about the dividing line between the real and the imagined or between one person's view of reality and another's. What about that question interests you and why do you want to present that as a question to your viewers? I think, uh, you know, I've thought a lot about this over the years. I have always been interested in the tension between sub our subjective view of the world and, and our faith that there's this objective reality sort of out there that we can't perceive. We have to perceive things subjectively, obviously. Um, but the more I've thought about it over the years, the more I, I realize to me, it, it relates to, um, the question that Ken and I were answering earlier about the theatrical film and, and how that works, because the thing about film is it's it's a unique combination of a subjective experience where you're really immersed in a world and a communal experience where there's empathy involved. And the more I thought about it, I realized that, you know, in a novel, you're simply communing with the author. It's a very entirely subjective experience. You read it on your own. In the theater, you have that wonderful communal experience, that shared experience, but you're all seeing the stage from a different point of view and you're very aware of that. Film has this incredible combination of the two and that the appeal of the, the medium itself, I think is based on the tension between uh, our subjective observations of the world and, and the objective reality and how those things tune in together. So I think, it, I think it's one of the things that makes uh, cinema a unique and, and timeless medium. Well, thank you to uh, Tom Schoen uh, for giving us this terrific book, The Nolan Variations, um, to you, Chris Nolan, and to Kenneth Branagh. Just, it's so wonderful to have you here, and we really greatly appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you soon, everybody. Stay tuned for good stuff in 2021.